I'm Andy Driscoll. What's more important? What is more important? Jobs or the long-term integrity of our air and water? What more are we as a society willing to sacrifice in terms of what we're able to eat, drink, and breathe in order to provide some, perhaps a lot, of short-term construction work along with far fewer full-time permanent jobs? Well, these are about a few questions that require some deep and introspective thinking and evaluating by millions of people who surely want clean air and water and unadulterated food, but who have, through no fault of their own, found themselves unemployed, limited in their training and education to the work they did before, and eager to earn a living for themselves and their families. And what makes projects like the polymet copper nickel mine project well north of the Twin Cities such a seductive venture. The mine would be dug smack in the middle of the Superior National Forest in what is called the Duluth Complex, a relatively untapped load of these metals, and in the Fond du Lac Indian Reservation, but the effects of chemicals unleashed, or liberated as they say, from the rock would be, according to all data, turn pristine lakes into acidic wastewaters. A deadly habitat for the wild rice Indians by nature for millennia and by treaty have been promised for a century or two. Now that's just the wild rice, not to mention all the other wildlife and other aquatic life there. Today we talk with many of the players in this drama in which corporate profit, labor seduction, regulatory submission, and political ambition are pitted yet again against everything Minnesota's Native Americans, water activists, even former miners, and the U.S. EPA of all agencies know to be true about digging around that rock through the sulfides and sulfates to get at all that copper and nickel harbored in what is called the Duluth Complex. The geological formation enriched by these ores that those chamber uh, commerce types find just too irresistible. Winona LaDuke and other critical activists join us to talk about acidic water and the treatment treaty violations this represents. Today, and rather than have a newscast, we want to bring you a short video. This video will be, um, is, is one that has been put together by our camera guy, um, Mr. Craig Stelmacher. Craig is uh, uh, on camera over here. And by the way, we are live on livestream.com uh, slash truth to tell men. And if you want to tr check us out, that's where we are uh, on video this morning. And you can also uh, tweet us. And uh, I've got Michelle Ali Maradi with me. Yes, so you can... Okay. I don't know if I'm on. There I am. Yeah. Um, yes, you can also uh, give us your comments via Twitter and Facebook. Uh, just tweet TTT Andy Driscoll. Please do include your first name uh, if you are posting a comment on Twitter uh, and you can also post your comments on Facebook either on Andy's Facebook page or on the Truth to Tell Facebook page and we will try to get to those before the end of the hour. For those listening on radio you will first uh, hear Craig's conversation with the EPA's Region 5 representative uh, from Chicago explaining just a bit about why the EPA is adamant about the agency's rejection of this project and its adverse rating of the project's environmental impact statement. Uh, these um, environmental impact statements are pretty arcane but very important uh, in most cases. Uh, let me just say this is a side thing. Uh, my experience with uh, EISs as they're called uh, is that they are mostly designed to enable a project not to really evaluate it. Uh, why this is why they can be found insufficient by people like the EPA. The EPA called its estimation of acid generation both during the mining operations a lifetime itself and after it closes inadequate. Now then you will hear as usual the ever loquacious 
DFL Iron Range State Representative Tom Rukavina, himself a candidate for governor last year, talk and talk and talk about why the EPA should be ignored as he and Republican representatives Denny McNamara of Hastings, who now chairs the committee that's responsible for this, uh, and Bob Barrett of Center City, who's a brand new boy on the on the uh, House side, spoke uh, to our colleague Marty, or on our colleague uh, Marty Owings Capital Report, seen Tuesdays on his website. Now, this three and a half minutes speaks loudly to the legislative thinking around this project. After the draft environmental impact statement came out, a harsh rejection letter came back from the EPA. I called the letter's author, Ken Westlake, of Region 5, to find out why. And I hear that this is a rather rare rating that isn't given out very often. It is. Um, uh, certainly the, the first time a uh, Region 5 project has received this rating in my nine plus years in, in my current position. Um, and I think we've only done seven adverse ratings uh, in Region 5 total since um, our national database was created in 1987. Okay, here's the deal, Marty, on that. First of all, you know, uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers was the lead federal agency, and the right. polymet folks did exactly what the Army Corps of Engineers asked them to do. The EPA was never involved in, in any of the requirements that polymet, the, the company, was told to do by both the DNR, who's the permitting agency, and okay. the lead agency in Minnesota, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. And then all of a sudden they get to Chicago, where this quote must have come from, and, uh, you know, uh, the EPA jumps in. Uh, their, their problem was uh, the DNR and the Army Corps of Engineers told PolyMet that they give us a couple of paths we can follow. Yeah. So their uh, environmental impact, uh, you know, their permitting request was, uh, was had three or four different paths mm -hmm. that you could go down to solve some of the problems that need to be addressed with copper yeah. nickel mining. Sure. And they did exactly what the Army Corps of Engineers told them to do. So okay. my understanding is that guy from the EPA got his rear end chewed after that. But, well, you know, but that's there's lawsuits irritating. flying yeah. in this so. whole thing, too. Oh, you know, well, there's lawsuits about it. Marty, I'll work. tell you what. Let's well, take there's you, not let, let me take your computer, put it on the ground, and jump on it. And then I'll kick yeah. that thing in over there because there's 26 metals in that little machine in that iPhone oh. you pulled out. Your ma or dad or somebody probably has a titanium hip or a pacemaker. The medical device industry down here in the University of Minnesota use all kinds of those metals. We can either mine them. And we right want to mine here. in North Minnesota. We want to mine them. And North Minnesota. We want to mine them here. You got me right all wound up. Because this is yeah. a whole NIMBY issue. So, you know, I mean. So, so the, the issue I have is we spent how many years on this issue? We spent Seven? Six, and six and a half. Six and a half years and, and about 24 million bucks. Sure. And none sure. of you guys it, down here close to the cities and especially in Hastings would ever put up with a uh, company coming in that wants to create thousands of jobs, mine $1.7 billion of minerals owned by the school kids of this state that goes into the school right. trust and the, and the University of Minnesota Permanent yeah. University Fund, none of you would put up what, what we have so to put up. My only point is we've spent all that time and all that money. We are a great nation. Couldn't we have solved the problem with that much money and that much time? Perhaps I think Derek, logically, right. we should, we should you, be able to do We're it. all on the same page here. And Representative Rukavina, Representative Barrett, and I are going to work together to get this project moving. Marty, we mm -hmm. want this to go forward. We got to have PolyMet serve as the example that we can do it right. Welcome back to Truth to Tell. I'm Michelle Ali Murat. And I'm Andy Driscoll. And before we get to the PolyMet mining case, we want to remind you all again that Truth to Tell not only streams live at kfai.org but we are now on our second week of video streaming our show live online at livestream.com slash truth to tell men just like that mn uh, uh, truth to tell men and available later on our facebook pages as well as blip tv we're getting so fancy around here. <laughs> Check out our website for links to both. 
And uh, as I said before, you can still join the conversation by uh, calling us on the phone. That number is 612-341-0980. That's 612-341-0980. Or, uh, like we were talking about before, tweet us at TTT Andy Driscoll. Please do include your first name in that if you... Uh, if you include your comment there, or you can post to Andy's Facebook page or the Truth to Tell Facebook page, and we will try to get those. Please do try to be brief, as we can't really address paragraphs here right. on the show as much as we would like to. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying that out because we know we've had uh, some people have trouble getting through on the phones. Yep, and we that just often happens, especially when you only have three lines coming into the place, and we've got two guests today uh, by telephone, so... Um, if you can get to a tweet or, uh, or uh, to a Facebook, it's great. Well, you know you're up against it when just about everyone who makes decisions about these things buckles to the applications and appeals of a corporation intending to follow the land we live near, the air we must breathe, the air we must, uh, the water we must drink or harvest to survive, or the food we must eat. The, the issues are always complicated, perhaps inevitably, by a population in economic crisis, workers not working, small business suffering, politicians wanting re-election more than just about anything else, and needing the votes of those workers and business owners. Appealing to their basis needs. Uh, appealing to their basis needs uh, is a snap when the opportunity to put some of them to work while polluting the natural resources they've taken for granted for decades. That the lakes will turn to sulfuric acid once the sulfides are liberated is either disputed or ignored by those whose financial interests lie in exploiting the copper and nickel loads. The six-year quest by Polymet Mining to open up a copper and nickel mine in northern Minnesota came along at precisely the right moment for most of our unemployed and hurting residents in the area around Babbitt, Minnesota and the Fond du Lac Indian Reservation. 2008, 2009, and last year were the leanest for the Iron Range since the Great Steel Strike of the mid-1950s and before that the Great Depression. Other mines already operate around that general area, which includes a large chunk of the Superior National Forest, which is by very name er, <laughs> the Superior National Forest would indicate some preservation of species like animals and wild rice. Moreover, American Indians have relied on the sacred wild rice crop in several of the waters up there, both for their spiritual as well as their economic sustenance. Thanks to our old friend Peter Erlander, a constitutional law professor at William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul and a global specialist in indigenous rights, we can see the language ratified in the Fond du Lac Treaty of 1826, which although referring to the Anishinaabe as Chippewa, acknowledges that the Fond du Lac tribe of Lake Superior remains the title holder of record with complete jurisdiction over those lands and that while the government may negotiate the extraction of metals and such, the tribes can say no if it will affect the tribe's ability to hunt, fish, and gather, including the adulteration of the habitat of their prey. In fact, all of northern Minnesota was eventually covered by these treaties and are written to affect Indians and non-Indians alike. So. Along with the overall quality and regulation issues, how can the state legislature or anyone else get away with jeopardizing those basic survival resources to extract metals that could easily ruin it for all future generations? Well, they're certainly trying. Bills are still wending their way through the State House and Senate that would authorize this open pit op mining operation, an operation the EPA has given its lowest rating to, as we suggested uh, with our discussion with Ken Westlake of the EPA. This opening open pit mining operation, the uh, um, or its highest rating, risk rating, however it should be said. And anyway, now we need to hear from our guests because the details are usually missing from media conversations and cities, even ours, especially something that should shame local media when so much is at stake. 
I suppose if Bud Grant were calling news conferences to insist on ignoring the treaties as he did with other Ojibwe treaties around fishing and hunting, we might be seeing coverage, but although it might have the wrong cast to it. But that's why we do this here, Andy. Yeah, that's right. Those issues that other people don't really that's want to That's what about. we like, Michelle. Uh, my name is Michelle Ali Marotti, and remember that you can get your comments here on the air by calling us at 612-341-0980. That's 612-341-0980. Tweet us at TTT Andy Driscoll or on Facebook at Andy's page or the Truth to Tell page. On the phone with us from Mount Pleasant, Michigan, is our friend and your friend, Winona LaDuke of the White Earth Indian Reservation and founder of the White Earth Land Recovery Project, Winona LaDuke, uh, who has at one, was at one time the lieutenant governor candidate for the National Green Party with Ralph Nader, has fought attempts to pollute the resources and to circumvent Indian treaties for decades. Her recent article in the Detroit Lakes online news site warns of the destruction of wild rice if House File 1010 were to pass. We'll hear more about that bill this morning. Winona, welcome back to our airwaves. Uh, thank you. And on the line with us in Ely, Minnesota, is retired state regulator and now concerned citizens fighting this project, Bruce Johnson. Welcome to you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Bruce. And what, what regulatory agency were you with? I worked for the DNR. Okay. The, the EPA. Oh. Pollution Control Agency and the uh, Department of Transportation. I'd say those are credentials of significant uh, 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 level here. Okay, here in the studio is the attorney for Water Legacy, one of the several groups who are working to stop the PolyMet project and enabling legislation is Paula Maccabee, who has represented environmental organizations like the Sierra Club and who is a former St. Uh, St. Paul City Council member. Welcome to Truth to Tell, Paula. Good morning, Andy. And here, too, is former DFL State Senator Jim Carlson, who authored an important bill last year when his party was in power, but still found a few takers. Despite the science behind this proposition, Jim Carlson, welcome to you. Thank you very much. Finally, all the way for, uh, from the North Country, here is retired miner Bob Tammon, whose perspective on this issue will be important since he can relate directly to the tantalizing economic uh, prospects this project provides. Welcome to you, Bob. Thanks, Andy. It's good to be here. First, let's uh, let's all right. First, let's um, talk a little bit uh, about. Um, uh, you you all heard this piece, right? Winona, did you hear our piece? Yeah, I did. I did hear it. Yeah, why, why, why don't you take off on Rukavina a little bit? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, tell us what you think about what's going on there. Uh, well, what I know is that uh, wild rice only grows here. It doesn't grow anywhere else in the world. And it is, you know, for Anishinaabe people, it is our most sacred food. It's a part of our migration stories, our original instructions, and that is why it is explicitly discussed in the treaties between the Ojibwe and the United States. So it's a treaty guaranteed right. It's the only grain uh, and one of the only foods that's mentioned specifically in a treaty. I know that the state of Minnesota has lost um, pretty profoundly in trying to litigate against the treaty rights of the Ojibwe, particularly in the Mille Lacs decision. Um, and, you know, spent about $20 million, well, actually I heard it was $40 million, trying to, um, trying to uh, you know, ensure that the Ojibwe couldn't, couldn't fish. I'm pretty sure the state doesn't want to go back to the mat on rice, um, which is pretty much, you know, the legal implications of this. These, the, you know, the reality, though, is, is that why would you have a state grain that you would then destroy? Um, why would you destroy the wild rice of Minnesota, which is such a great gift, to all people, um, you know, uh, in addition to the Ojibwe, in the name of, you know, a couple of corporations' profits. And it is, it, it is interesting, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize that wh wild rice was quite so unique to Minnesota. Uh, that, that is uh, really something. Well, let's, let's just be real about this. It's actually unique to Anishinaabe people. Where we are is where rice is, and we're in the northern part of five American states, about three of which have rice and in the southern part of four Canadian provinces, about three of which have rice. So 
the geographic borders of Minnesota are not of interest to the rice or to the Ojibwe's. But what I will say is, is that this is a very unique gift. You know, it's the only place in the world that rice grows, and you can't replace it once you, you know, contaminate the waters. And you can't compl- replace the water after you contaminate the waters. You've got one shot going through from what I, you know, what I can tell, and I think we should do it right. Uh, Paula McAbee. I think what, what Winona says is very important, that wild rice is a gift to the Anishinaabe people. And what is at stake here is not only the wild rice, it's our treaty obligations, and it's also who sets the rules. What is unprecedented is that the mining companies, they came to Minnesota saying, we're going to give you some jobs, and we're going to do a great job with the environment and follow all the rules. And no, no sooner had they said that, they turn around and they're trying to remove the rules that govern all other businesses and say, we want special privileges, we want to be able to dig the rock out and pollute the water and harm the wild rice. And the same sulfate that destroys wild rice also increases the level of mercury methylation. Minnesota already has so much mercury in fish that it's not safe for pregnant women or children. Explain mercury methylation a little bit, will you? Mercury is a natural organic element and what happens as a result of burning fossil fuels, primarily coal, is air deposition of mercury. Now what happens when mercury comes into contact with sulfates is it makes it up the food chain so that the mercury in the water can be concentrated 10,000 times by the time it gets into a walleye or a northern at the top of the food chain. And what putting extra sulfates in the water does, in addition to devastating the wild rice, is it increases the degree to which mercury can contaminate our fish. Some of the research suggests it's even as high as twice as much mercury in the fish. So by trying to violate the standards or change them to suit their interests, the mining companies are putting wild rice at work at risk, they're putting contaminated mercury and fish at risk, and so they're putting human health at risk too. How much, how much wa- of the w- lakes and waters are being affected, would be affected up there? Well, let's just start with the PolyMet project, and then I'll let Bob talk about the scope of mining. The PolyMet project drains into wetlands um, for the Embarrass and Partridge rivers. And that those rivers go down through the St. Louis River, which is the largest river draining into Lake Superior. Yes, I know. Yeah, that's and, right. And so it goes through um, the Fadalak Reservation, the St. Louis River, and also at the bottom of the St. Louis River is an estuary, which is basically where fish are spawned for all of Lake Superior. So this is a critical national resource. It's a critical resource for clean water. It's a cl- critical resource for fishermen. And when we talk about jobs, we have to think about all the jobs in Minnesota that are based on having fish, angling, tourism, harvesting of wild rice. So it's not just... So it's not just mining, it's used our construction jobs. Well, and how many, how many estimated jobs would this mine be putting in place, if it were? Bob Tammon? Well, uh, permanent jobs, it's less than 400. So when you look at the fact that the population of... St. Louis County, we tend to run about 100,000 jobs. This is less than one half of 1%. It's just a blip. And when you think of the damage it's going to go do to the northern Minnesota, I don't believe it's worth the price because, you know, the, the Mesabi Iron Range is roughly 100 miles long, stretching from Grand Rapids up to near Ely. Mm-hmm. So we have 100 miles of mining, and Paula mentioned we have some damage from those mines leaking into our existing waters. We have a dead zone in the St. Louis River that's over 100 miles long. The wild rice is gone. So I think that 100 miles of the Mesabi Iron Range and the 100 mile dead zone in the St. Louis River are connected. There's a connection there. We should be dealing with that and cleaning up that existing mess before we start licensing sulfide mining. Uh, you know, this whole thing about dead zones interests me. I think I want to get back to that a little bit. Uh, uh, Winona, I know that you can't stay with us forever, so I, I want to take advantage of your presence on online here. Uh, but would you tell us, how is it that the White Earth Reservation and perhaps even other reservations between you and the Fond du Lac people uh, uh, are actually going to be affected by this particular project, or are you? Well, the reality is, is that rice ripens when it ripens. And so most of our people harvest rice off reservation um, in the beginning. I mean, we reserved a reservation with good rice resources on it, but we have 25,000 tribal members and we eat a lot of rice. 
And so we start, um, you know, down further south, and then we keep moving, moving north. And all the Anishinaabe have always practiced that. As I said, the borders are really a, a very little ref, re- relevance to us. And so you harvest rice when the rice becomes, is prepared, is ready for you. All right. And so we go off reservation, and we harvest, and then we, um, you know, move further north, and we end up on our rice lake on oh. my reservation, the last. But I see. many of my tribal members go throughout that region, so you all get, as do most. You, you all get together for this uh, work. <laughs> uh, that's, that's great. Bob. Okay, Bob Tammon, you were well, going to say. I was going to point out the point that Winona makes that they, they rice on their reservation, but actually the land off of their reservation is still treaty area. Oh, yes. They retain the rights to hunt and gather. My wife and I were happy to live in northern Minnesota, but I realized that we live within the boundaries of the 1854 treaty, and our neighbors over there at Boys Fort, and they're good neighbors, they have certain rights that they have retained that they never surrendered, that they can rice not only on their reservations, they retain their right, right to rice on Birch Lake, where Pat and I have a little property. Well, that's a huge that's a huge issue. Uh, are you running into the same thing up there, Bruce Johnson? Um, I, I don't deal too much with wild rice. I'm more in the chemistry end of the uh, okay. Uh, the thing. We have uh, an existing mine that has been there for thirty years that had taken out sulfide materials. So we've got an after case already. We don't we don't have to say, well, gee, we don't know what's going to happen. Let me let me just follow up, um, follow Andy. Um, Bruce Johnson, um, I sort of being a little modest here, he did extensive research on the Dunka mine. And the Dunka mine is a taconite mine that ran into a small corner of Duluth Rock. And just a, a, just that small corner of Duluth Complex Rock has resulted in acid mine drainage for now 40 years. And what we can look at the, the Dunka mine and understand the implications for wild rice, for fish, and for pollution. Because what happened there is the level of um, sulfates has been as high as 1,000 milligrams per liter, whereas the sulfite limit is 10 milligrams per liter. And because the company... Say, say that one more time now. A hundred times. A yes. hundred times more sulfates coming yeah. off of that Dunka mine than the regulated limit to protect wild rice. Now, and they're not mining sulfates. They're, they're, that's a byproduct of the mining operation, is it? That's a byproduct. What happens is when there's sulfide in the rock and it's exposed to air and water, that that is a byproduct of that exposure. And what happened in the Dunka mine is the mine went bankrupt and they had a, a water treatment plant that they just stopped operating because it would cost 1.2 million a year. And the Minnesota DNR has documented that that cost over a hundred years, so you're looking at an excess of a hundred million dollars cost just for encountering a small area of Duluth complex rock. You mean they just walked away from this mine they, and everything else? That is the tradition, that is the history of hard rock mining across the country. And the US EPA has now, is now in the process, and this is going to segue into our financial assurance, the US EPA is now in the process of writing rules on financial assurance. Because across the country, the biggest source of Superfund liability, where the taxpayers have to step in and clean up polluted water, yeah. is is hard rock copper sulfide mining and between um, I think it's 1998 and 2007 the US federal government had to spend 2.7 billion that's billion with a B just in cleaning up hard rock mining water contamination so uh, Winona can you stick around for a while I can for a bit. All right, good. Well, great, because we need to I take mean, it. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you, Paula, for your comments and all of you. Okay, d- just hang on a second. Uh, we're all going to come back in just a minute. Uh, we have with us Winona. Ledu- Winona, stop just trying to speak too fast, Andy. <laughs> Winona LaDuke uh, of the White Earth Indian Reservation. Uh, and we're talking about uh, s- the sulfides and the sulfate byproducts uh, the, of, of copper and nickel mining prospects for the poly net mining case up in northern Minnesota, which will actually affect all uh, indigenous peoples across northern Minnesota, somewhat in violation of their treaty. We also have with us retired miner Bob Tammon, who has his finger on the mining operations up there. We have Bruce Johnson's from Ely. He's on the phone with us, and he's a, a, a former regulator from every agency that ever regulated anything in the <laughs> state. 
<laughs> and uh, and and joining us also is Jim Carlson, former state senator, whose uh, expertise is in the so-called financial assurance area. That financial assurance is essentially the liability of probably of companies to stand behind their operations and uh, live up to their contracts. So we'll get we'll get to that business. We want to talk to all of you uh, uh, some more about this, but we got to take a quick break right now. It's about nine thirty. This is one of the fastest conversations I've ever had. Uh, good morning all to you on Livestream.com. Uh, truth to tell, Min uh, is, is uh, there for uh, all of you to watch live. And we'll have the video of this entire show available later. Uh, right now, we're going to take a quick break. Come on back. Remember to give us a call at 612-341-0980. 612-341-0980. And we're going to tweet or post or post on facebook either one well, uh, michelle hasn't got a word in edgewise today <laughs> yeah i'm i'm just um, she's very curious here <laughs> she's also been I, i'm taking it all in yeah we've we've got a lot of stuff to a talk about a lot of about. stuff to talk about so here we go we'll be right back programming on kfai is sponsored by saint paul public library presenting national book award winner philip who's april 28th and 29th Hoos will discuss Claudette Colvin, Twice Towards Justice, where he weaves the story of a largely unknown civil rights figure into the Montgomery bus boycott and court case. Details at sppl.org or 651-266-7000. The time is now 9.31 a.m. on Monday morning. You are listening to Truth to Tell on Fresh Air Community Radio, KFAI 90.3 FM Minneapolis and 106.7 FM St. Paul. We are radio without boundaries. Programming on KFAI is made possible in part through grants from the state of Minnesota. And now back to Truth to Tell with Andy Driscoll and Michelle Ali Marati. <laughs> We're back on Truth to Tell. I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll, and we're talking about the Polymet uh, copper and nickel mining operation that is proposed uh, uh, for up north in the in the Iron Range, uh, uh, harvesting metals out of the what is called the Duluth complex, which is sort of a crescent-shaped load of, uh, of minerals that uh, sort of uh, curve around Duluth and up into deeper into the Iron Range in St. Louis County, if I recall correctly. So um, uh, we're, we're trying to make this as clear as we can for you. This has been six and a half years uh, in the making. The politicians are heavily behind this thing because of the jobs it'll create and the votes it'll get. And, uh, of course, the Polymet would like to have the profits from all this operation. But there's a history of mining and its effects uh, on the uh, natural resources of this state, and not the least of which is wild rice, the wild rice crop uh, among the Anishinaabe people. By the way, Anishinaabe is a wonderful name, isn't it? It, it that this means rolls off the It's the Ojibwe people, uh, sometimes known as Chippewa in the old treaty language. Language. We don't say Chippewa much anymore. Uh, there's Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, but uh, that doesn't change. That won't change. But it's Ojibwe and the Anishinaabe people. Okay. All right. On the phone with us is uh, Winona LaDuke, and she's talking from Michigan, and she can stay for a few more minutes. But L Winona, you had a really a fine article. Had a little sort of a. Uh, sort of a, a sarcastic twist to it. <laughs> I thought it was very uh, humorous that you had in the uh, in the Detroit Lakes online uh, thing. Talk a little bit about more what you're you're concerned about up there. Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to kind of backtrack. I mean, not Please all do. things have a price tag. That's what I want to say. I don't know what the price tag is for the water of Minnesota. I don't know what the price tag is for fish, their quality of life, their right to be a fish without being contaminated. As the commercial says, it's priceless? Right. That's pretty much what I would say. And I don't know what the price tag is for our rice. I'm pretty sure that you can't compare all things like, you know, Polymet's profits or the mining company's profits. You know, essentially, um, you know, what, what I know is that not just Ojibwe people, but many people rely on rice to feed our families. And to, you know, for our spiritual purposes, but my community is really low income. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we aren't wealthy. What we are wealthy with is who we are as Anishinaabe people, and we are wealthy with rice. This, you know, loophole that you can basically drive the mining companies through and destroy all the water in Minnesota is, is not right. You know, you, there is nobody who has the right to deny our people the right to feed ourselves, which is basically what this, what this proposal does. You know, uh, 400 jobs, you know, how long are those going to last? As, as opposed to time immemorial when you have rice. Yep. Those kind of questions are really quality of life questions for Minnesota. And, you know, the reality is, is, that, is that, you know, this, that 40-year ch- you know, standard is only being challenged for the benefit of some mining companies. Um, you know, the re- and the reality is, is that, you know, we live in a, in a society, I don't want me to get too big on this, but we live in a country which consumes way too much resources and is highly inefficient. And so long as we continue this proposal where new jobs and new economics are predicated on more destruction of our natural world and more destruction and compromising of every future generation, we have no hope of, you know, having any durable economic and and secure base. And, you know, this is just really entirely the wrong way. We have the potential to, to, you know, clean up the the 100-mile dead zone. We have the potential to restore our waters so that we can fish off out of them and they're not contaminated with mercury. We have the potential to create a green economy based on, you know, wind and solar rather than a reboot of nuclear power. And we have the potential to protect the wealth of Minnesota and the wealth of the initiative, the wealth of this land, which is wild rice. And I'd like to talk a little bit, I, I don't know how much longer you're going to be with us, Winona, but uh, Winona, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the policies that are in place currently that are just not being enforced, and I think we want to hear probably from Bruce about that, and and then from Jim Carlson about... We know that you've been fighting these for a long time. <clears throat> Obviously, some of them have been losing battles, and... Yeah, wh- yeah. Where, well, so far, we have no genetically engineered wild rice, so you got to give us credit for that one. I mean, I just think that the words wild rice should not be associated with the words genetically engineered. <laughs> <I would> yeah, not. <laughs> you know, it's like some places you just should say no. And this is another place you should just say no. I mean, you've got standards that were fought for, you know, not only by the Ojibwe, but by the enlightened people of Minnesota to keep the, you know, to keep the sulfide, to keep the water from getting contaminated. You know, the whole proposal of changing that you know, after $20 million of investments and, and you know, the most, um, you know, dire report from the EPA, just for the benefit of mining companies, is baffling to me. And the fact that it could get through this far in the legislature and now require, you know, I'm not actually sure, you know, Paula should tell us where it's at, but, you know, I'm hoping that we aren't to where the, you know, Dayton just has to veto it, but he has to veto it. You know, there's no way that this, this regulation should go through and that they should be able to, conti- to, to continue their proposal. Wow. There's Paul McAvee. so much there to comment on. First, I think we need to make sure that people understand that in addition to destroying wild rice, contaminating fish, and contaminating water, the mining proposals are also a very serious threat in terms of global climate change. The Polymet mine proposes to impair or destroy more than 1,500 acres of wetlands. And this is by far the largest wetland destruction that the St. Paul Office of the United States Army Corps of Engineers has ever even looked at. I don't understand why the Army Corps has been assigned this this uh, this whole business of regulating a mine construction. I don't understand that. Here, here's the the the, the process is, and this is legally it's sort of complicated. But the Army Corps of Engineers, their job is to see whether someone can fill in wetlands, and that responsibility came from their their duty to make sure that waters remain navigable. What we have argued as water legacy is that in addition to the Army Corps of Engineers. There are certain procedures under the Clean Water Act that would give the United States EPA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and tribes that have waters affected, such as the Fond du Lac a band of the Anishinaabe, they would have jurisdiction also over whether this yeah. wetland jurisdiction. And but Luca we, Vina claims that that you know he sort of dismisses all of that. Well, he, I I think he's wrong 
And okay. I've done a lot of research, and, and the Army Corps of Engineers has acknowledged that they're going to re reissue a notice. And the uh, we're talking with the US EPA, and the tribes now have the capacity to serve as a Department of Natural Resources, and they really? intend to do so. Excellent. So, and then I, I think what Winona was talking about is also what is really happening, who is really benefiting. And the Polymet is a shell corporation, all foreign investors. Um, and the proposal here is that Whatever is dug out of the ground, out of that copper deposit, that mineral is gone. It's going to China. So the profits are going to go to foreign investors. The copper is going to go to uh, to Asia. And Isn't that going to come back in, in, into my Apple computer? It might. And you know what? A lot shorter way of getting it into that Apple computer would be if we were to recycle our copper. Because what the um, it, this is acknowledged by the, the scrap metal industry is that there's 90% less energy consumed if you recycle rather than dig stuff out of the ground. Well, let's talk about the the mines that you've and, already and mentioned. We know that jump in if you need to. Yeah. So. No, I'm quite content. He's doing great. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the mines that you've mentioned earlier that are already shut down, that are they're no longer being mined. I mean, what? how long are we talking here that, that people would even be mining in this area? I mean, how long would these jobs even be around? Uh, it's not unusual for these mines to shut down in 10, 20 years. We have the taconite plant in Wisconsin at Black River Falls. Very few people have heard of that, but I helped wreck it out. Uh, you wreck it out. Eh? Uh, well, I, I, I love these terms that you guys get into. <laughs> so you call it wrecking, wrecking it out. Well, actually, I worked in the mines many years, and mining is boom and bust. So I was down here in the metropolitan area occasionally working for XL Energy in their substation department. They sent me over to Black River Falls to move a transformer, disconnect the transformer, move it. And I thought, why are we doing this? Well, I saw the plant there. It was an old taconite plant, and they'd abandoned it because they built a new one on Minnesota's Iron Range, north of Virginia. They couldn't afford to run both of them at once. They just tore down the one in Wisconsin, and now they're proposing another iron mine in Wisconsin. Those people, most of them aren't aware that they already had an iron mining industry and it went away in a few years. Now that's the Pinocchio in the Pinocchio that, Mountains up by uh, up by Iron River. Yeah, and south Ashland of Ashland and, there. And, yep, and so by Madeline Island. I know. They're that's my place. They're talking prosperity. Well, they tried prosperity with mining uh, 30, 40 years ago and it didn't work. And we've yeah, had right. the same problem on Minnesota's Iron Range with companies going bankrupt. Of course, Polymet wants to reuse an old taconite mining plant to process the ore for the crushing. And I've been on that plant side. I've been on, I worked directly for a mining company for U.S. Steel. Then I worked for contractors. So I've been on several of these plant sites. I've been out and driven on these tailing ponds dikes. Every one of the tailings ponds on the Masabi Iron Range are leaking. All the taconite tailings ponds are leaking. And Polymet wants the to... The ponds themselves are leaking. The tailings ponds are leaking. Okay. For example, Mintac, it, uh, they, in their own documents, they acknowledge leaking 4 million gallons a day. The old Erie plant that went bankrupt, Polymet wants to reuse that plant in their first environmental impact statement. They proposed to reuse the old tailings pond, which is already leaking. So it's leaking iron mining waste in excess of Minnesota's discharge standards. This is in violation. Then they want to dump their copper mining waste on top of that iron mining waste and claim that it's not going to do any damage when they've already polluted wells downstream of that what plant. It, what's being done about that waste that's leaking right now? Uh, there's been some legal action to try to them to force them to clean up. I talked to some MPCA people a couple of years ago. They said, well, the best way to clean it up is just to let it leak, and when the water's all gone, it'll quit leaking. Well, that plant went bankrupt in 2001. So that's 10 years it's been leaking, and their idea is just to stand by and let her leak. When they've already, it's going into the Embarrass River, into the St. Louis River, the 100-mile dead zone again. I think this is this is a really critical issue. Paula and McAbee. Um, we and Bruce Johnson and Water Legacy and I, we've been working very hard to try and get our agencies, particularly the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Minnesota DNR, to step up to the responsibilities that are in our current laws and regulations. You We're can't not say their history is strong on this issue. I think that there is so much... Huh? It's abysmal. Abysmal. Not, <laughs> I, I think history is abysmal simply abysmal in, in regulating the, this mine up there. They've had uh, years and years, they, they've got seepages out of this mine. There's 30-some seepages out of there that uh, rate from zero to 500 gallons per day, uh, per minute. Uh. And 
and they're seeping into Second Creek, which also seeps into uh, uh, Colby Lake, which is the drinking water supply for Hoyt Lakes. They took sulfate hornfells from the Dunka pit that they happened to encounter, and the sulfate they didn't want to put at the Dunka pit because it would have probably produced acid. The DNR then let them put that in the tailing basin. And the most recent DNR report on sulfate indicates that there's high sulfate coming out of that tailing basin now, and the, the suspicion is, hmm, where did that come from? Well, it came from what DNR let them do by putting it in the tailing basin. I think what they're doing here is, is kicking the can down the road. They don't know what to do with the basin, so let's just keep it operating. This is That's Uber regulator Bruce Johnson, by the way. And, and, and I think what Bruce is, and I have been working on is... And, and we've all been saying is until we can show that we can clean up the tailing basins we have right now that are leaking, that we can reduce the sulfate from the Dunka mine right now so it is not violating standards. Which would create jobs. Well, there would be jobs in remediation and yes. there would be real expense. What is happening is we until we clean up the mess we've already created, we shouldn't be creating more mess. And if we're asking the mining companies to develop plans to mine responsibly, they need to know what the dollars are are to make sure that Minnesota water quality standards aren't violated. We're doing nobody a favor by just closing our eyes to the pollution that exists because they get a false idea of what the economics are. And moving forward, I mean, where where is the hole? Is the hole that when you first give permission to build these mines, are they not taking into account the actual damage that will take place? Are they not enforcing the the standards as as the mining <laughs> begins? I mean, where what, where is the hole? What is the problem? There are several holes. The first hole, and uh, there's a study that came out of Colorado, the first hole is that the contractors who put together the EISs do exactly what Andy was talking about before. They try and create a rosy story that denies the fact that the way they're planning to do the mining will violate water quality standards. That's why it's taken six years. An honest EIS that just said, we know what we're going to do. It's going to violate A, B, C, and D water quality standards. We could have done that in six months. But the point is they're trying to create a document that's large enough, complex enough, uses models incorrectly enough, all of which the EPA has pointed out, so that they can conceal the fact they're likely to violate arsenic standards, sulfate standards, mercury standards. So the first flaw is the regulators, and that's all the ones that Bruce used to work with, have to hold the contractors to honesty and say, if it's going to violate, say it. The second is, once the mine is up and running, and the jobs are there, and the company pleads poverty, it, it we need to hold our regulators responsible for enforcing the laws. And they, the, they, the uh, Pollution Control Agency entered into a consent decree earlier this year with some mining companies that have been polluting. Now, consent decree for that our means, audience. What that, what that means is um, some organizations threatened to, to file a lawsuit because Erie, Cliffs Erie, and other mines were continuing to violate water quality right. standards. And the Pollution Control Agency says, we're going to negotiate with you. You're going to do some more studies. And then they gave them a fine of $58,000. Oh, by golly, that'll <laughs> dig into their profits. <laughs> That's a slap on the wrist. Oh, and my. I think what what we need to do is talk is talk to our regulators. And the citizens have to be a counterbalance because they hear from the mining companies every day. Okay, so uh, what I want to do now is get to Jim Carlson's bill that failed last hey, you year. You guys, I gotta go. We're not hey. here, but. Winona, thank Keep you it up so much. And, uh, let's get this bill vetoed or stopped because it's wrong. Okay, we'll 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 bring you back and we'll uh, do some follow up work on this. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Winona. Thank you. Winona Leduc joining us from Michigan. Um, Jim Carlson, you had a, a, a bill last year that failed called financial assurance. Yes. All right. We want to talk about that. Um, uh, uh, as soon as we, I better we better take one quick break. Uh, I think we only have one more today anyway. That's good. And uh, Jim, Sen former Senator Jim Carlson, will talk about uh, financial assurances from the companies and and forcing them on that, trying to force some uh, responsibility on their backs. Uh, obviously, some mining companies are a little resistant to this. Uh, Attorney Paula McAbee, who represents Water Legacy and several other environmental groups, uh, former retired. My former retired miner. Um, <laughs> he'll be 
back to work any day now. Uh, Bob Tammon, who uh, lives up in the North Country and uh, used to work for the mining industry. Uh, Bruce Johnson, a uh, regulator from the EPA, the MPCA, the DNR. My gosh, he's great. And he's still on the line with us from Ely. So... Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please give us a call at 612-341-0980. We'd love to hear from you. You can also tweet us uh, at TTT Andy Driscoll or post your comments to Facebook at uh, Andy Driscoll's page or the TTT We'll be right page. back. Yep. Programming on KFAI is sponsored by the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, presenting the 13th annual Untold Stories Labor History Series through May. The documentary Philosopher Kings, featuring the stories of custodians at prestigious colleges and universities, will be screened May 4th. A complete list of events is available at thefriends.org. Programming on KFAI is sponsored by St. Paul Public Library, presenting Greening, How to Get Around, Saturday, April 30th at Hamlin Midway Library. Learn practical strategies for introducing more biking, walking, and busing into your daily trips. Hosted by St. Paul Public Library, St. Paul's original reuse center. Details at sppl.org or at 651-266-7000. We're back on Truth to Tell. I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll. We're uh, back talking about the polymet mining issue, and it is one complex issue, I must say. Uh, Winona LaDuca, as you heard in her parting remarks, was saying, Veto that bill! Well, let's find out first. Uh, is, is the bill passed? Is there a bill that has passed that will enable polymet to do this? Well, um, Andy, real quickly, and then I, um, I want to hear from, from former Senator Carlson. There are two different versions of a bill that would gut the Wild Rice Standard, a Senate and a House version, and they have not yet conferred to get one bill. And when you say gut the standard, what is the standard? Um, the current standard is only 10 milligrams per liter of sulfates in waters that contain wild rice. The House bill would weaken that. The Senate bill would completely suspend the operation of the standard. And if there's one thing that people that are listening can do, it's get on Governor Dayton's comment page and tell them, veto any bill that guts, weakens, undermines, suspends, throws out the window the wild rice sulfate standard because p mining companies should follow the rules, not remake the regulations to suit their own interests. Absolutely not. Now, Jim, uh, you've, you've uh, been very patient for 50 <laughs> minutes here. Uh, learned a lot. <laughs> good. Uh, former Senator Jim Carlson, who uh, uh, hails from Egan, Minnesota, uh, down south there in Tim Pawlenty country. Uh, <laughs> He didn't have your seat, but he had one of the house seats in your district, right, at one point? Right. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah, he had my seat. Unfortunately, yes. Jim, oh, it was your seat. He was, well, I was no, the senator, but I, uh, he had, he was my representative. Yeah, he was your representative. Okay. And uh, several Democrats were defeated down there. Uh, unfortunately, Jim was one of them. Yes. But uh, he carried a bill last year. Talk about that bill. Well, the bill was uh, something that you know, I like to call it the sustainable mining bill. And... I'm not opposed to us looking into harvesting some of our natural resources like some of these, uh, you know, these metals because uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be on the air today if we didn't have some of the technology involved and some of the technology that comes from harvesting some of these natural resources and the, in the, the uh, very specific metals that are up there. But having said that, we can't be crazy about it. We have to, th this particular type of mining is, uh, you well, know, uh, so it's the acid I, production. I don't it. really like to use too many uh, mined uh, games, but this is kind of like a tsunami in slow motion. Okay. Because you're really talking about something that could have some very, very slow and long-term damage to the environment. It's not something that you know, is acute. And that's part of the problem, that's isn't it? Exactly right. I mean, for making it uh, real for people, is to they you know everything is immediate today so if if it doesn't strike them today they're not worrying about it they're going to put it off on the back burner for the most part and they're not going to put pressure on their uh, legislators because you know like uh, uh, like Scarlett O'Hara 
tomorrow's another day. <laughs> and today we're alive and we can be grateful for that and we can fish and hunt today. Uh, but uh, tomorrow may not be yeah, as tomorrow, far away as it seems. That's right. Tomorrow uh, you might be fishing up there and you may not be able to eat your fish. And of course, the, you know, the Native Americans up there, their uh, diet is far higher in fish than it is for us living in Egan and in, in Minneapolis Indeed. and St. Paul. And so the recommendations for us is I, I believe it's no more than one one fish per week or something like that, that or month and that's and be careful then, where you get yeah. it because if it may emerge that's correct. Right. So what we're looking at is having some mechanism here to ensure that we don't get stuck with the same kinds of problems that other states and even other countries have had. And so what uh, and I've I've had quite a uh, uh, an interest in surface and subsurface water for a long time, and so I was approached to carry this bill, and the bill. Um, the bill, well, it did generally four things. It didn't stop this this mine. What it did was it made uh, made it a mandate that the draft environmental impact statement ought to evaluate what the short and long term uh, threats are to our water quality, and what's what the mining company is going to take to make sure that we protect it. The second thing is to come up with a financial cost to uh, mitigate the uh, immediate damage and also put something in place for perpetual damage so that when a mining company shuts down when the the um, you know the veins dry up anything like that and like Bob said this is a boom and bust uh, if somebody walks away from it that there will be something in place to perpetually take care of the problems that are going to be coming from this, like these the tailings. rivers right Bob that's yeah. true and you know what uh, while I'm speaking, I'd like to express my personal appreciation of Jim Carlson for stepping out in front in this. And I think probably my service in Vietnam colored my whole life since then in a way. And I remember what it was like in the early stages of that war to be against the war. It took a tremendous amount of courage yes. to stand alone. And you know, Senator Carlson stepped out front. He, he was there for us. I appreciate that. <laughs> now, Bruce Johnson, let's before, you know, we got to get your licks in here a little bit. and Because you've, uh, you've, you've been around this thing. Why, why doesn't the EPA's regulatory function uh, really supersede almost anything else? Well, as, ultimate, as, ultimately it will. But um, the, the problem is that these are what they call minor dischargers. And they're less than a million gallons a day. So EPA really? Is pretty, so it's based on volume, is it? Yeah, and they pretty well leave that up to the states to do, and, and they don't look at uh, anything other than a major permit very carefully. Um, they've, they've been, these permits have been gerrymandered for years, and uh, they are not million-gallon-a-day permits as of 1990. Uh, EPA put out a directive that they had to look at the toxicity of the discharge also, which has been totally ignored by both EPA and PCA. What and so if, if you'd start looking at these discharges, you'd find that uh, at the Dunka mine, you, you'd have a major discharge, and EPA should be scrutinizing that discharge where they aren't. Well, they've already given a bad rating to this one. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Andy, what you're saying is is real hopeful because um, Bruce is right. In the past, with the Dunka mine and some of the other taconite mines, the level of scrutiny has not been that high. But with a polymet mine, it hasn't only been the EPA, but the citizens who provided the scrutiny. A lot of times. A project goes through and no one comments. There were 3,700 comments on the polymet mine really? by regular citizens. And we had one of our... It would be nice to get them out to the planning commission meeting here. <laughs> well, we, had a, we actually had a volunteer go and read them, and more than 80% were people who were opposed to the mine or expressing concerns about the environment. So I think Bruce is right. If we just leave this in the quiet recesses of the agency, like the Duncan mine, the result is no protection. If, if we as citizens and as um, active people are asking the EPA to look at our problems, if we are making comments, if we are participating, that is how Minnesota's resources will, will be protected in the future as they haven't been in the past. Say, what are the chances of getting you all to come back next week? Are you available? Uh, probably. All right. Bruce? Yes. All right. I'll tell you what, we've run out of time so quickly here. I think this thing de de deserves another hour. And I'd like to come 
to have you come back and let's do another hour next week. Sounds good. That. Sounds sure. good. Thank All you. All right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we could. Andy planning we, on the fly. <laughs> we have just beginning. You know, this is planning on the fly. All right, but <laughs> you know why? Because we're a community station, and we can do whatever we want. Well, and we're talking about a, I think we're talking about a fundamental change in the way we look at regulating these types of things. It doesn't seem to be about so much the size of the contract or, or even the amount of leakage. It's about where you put it and what the impact of the individual ecosystems will do. And we'll get back yeah. into the politics of it, of course, and, and okay. why it's important that we that we hold people accountable, that we get to the bills, that we talk to the governor. Who knows? Maybe I can get the governor to talk. Maybe he will. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us for this obviously robust conversation. We're already out of time, so I've got to, we're going to say goodbye. But Bob Tammon, retired miner, Paula McAvee, attorney uh, for Water Legacy, and boy, are you loaded with information, Paula. And... Uh, uh, Bruce Johnson out there in Ely, uh, give my love to Bert Lake Burnside in the North Arm, will you? <laughs> oh, you betcha. Oh, good. And we'll see you next week. And uh, Jim Carlson, you can be here. Thank good. You. All right. All right. We'll see you all next week. We'll continue this conversation on polymet mining because it has ripple effect throughout the state. Thank and you very much. Until then, I'm Michelle Ali Morani. And I'm Andy Driscoll, and I want to thank my crew for joining us. See you next week, and do take care of each other.